Coming up next on this special music edition of Arizona Horizon, we meet renowned conductor Tito Munoz, new music director of the Phoenix Symphony, and we'll visit with legendary solo artist and E Street Band guitarist Nils Lofgren. That's next on this special edition of Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to the special music edition of Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. We begin tonight by meeting Tito Munoz, one of the most talented conductors of his generation. Tito Munoz was recently named music director of the Phoenix Symphony. I talked to Munoz about his new role. It's good to have you here. Thanks it's for a joining pleasure. us. Pleasure to be here. Uh, any previous experience in Arizona, Phoenix, uh, Southwest? Uh, the the two times that I visited to conduct the orchestra for my uh, basically my audition, yes. So basically, this is still kind of new to you. It's then. very much new to me. Yeah. Excited. Yeah, it's hot. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it it's is. It's very hot here. All right, I want to ask a bunch of basic questions uh, just because I can. Sure. Uh, you are the new music director of the Phoenix. What does a music director do? Um, that's a good question. Um, aside from what a conductor normally does, which is come into a, a situation uh, with a new orchestra and, and guide the musicians through a program of music, um, you know, we give the concerts, we try to get achieve a high level, we try to maybe build on something that we might have worked on before. Um, but essentially with a music director, because it will, it will be a, a situation where I'm going to see the orchestra m much more frequently, so you know, all throughout the year, um, then my goals will not just be the concert, they'll be far-reaching goals. They'll be, you know, uh, trying to build on artistic, uh, you know, uh, accomplishments that we've had, you know, to, to f further reaching. Yeah. Um, and aside from that, it's also just helping the orchestra um, as an organization achieve more uh, more of an audience throughout the throughout the community and, and be part of the community and get more people excited about classical music it can orchestral music it is so steeped in tradition and every time a new CD comes out you know for most of it just kind of sounds like the last CD of that particular <laughs> piece <laughs> right but, but can orchestral music be advanced and if so how well I, I think that it's not a question of the music itself I think it's just the way it's presented mm. I think uh, just like a museum needs to always kind of think of new ways of presenting what they already do I mean you, you, you we all know that Van Gogh is a great painter, um, and we we somehow want to try to find a way to connect and see a painting by Van Gogh, just as Beethoven's a great composer. Um, and it's I think it's just a way of uh, kind of giving the audience a um, a relatable experience in a way that uh, gives them more of an opportunity to see what those things are. Um, so I don't think it's the music. I really think it's just the way we, we, we present it that needs to be that needs to be updated. Interesting. Okay, now. As a conductor, because most of us in the audience, there's there's one person moving that seems like more than all the others, <laughs> and it's you. It's the conductor. Yes. What, what when the performance is being done? What does a conductor actually do? Okay, that's a very good question, and the way I like to explain it is, um, it's very similar to what a director of a of a of a, a play of a movie would be doing. Um, which is, of course, they have their their people, their actors, their 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 people interpreting a script, um, and a director would have to have that script in front of them and know exactly what they want to get out of it. Um, a conductor is the same thing. We have a score, we have our music, we want to get something out of it, and we have our talented musicians uh, that do it, that actually do it. But because our rehearsal time is very short, and because uh, we we've, tr we've been trained to kind of be able to follow gestures, we do some of our directing actually in real time at the concert. So what you're seeing is a conductor trying to convey to the musicians what to do and how to do it. I mean, of course they can read, but there's a certain kind of element of spontaneity and in, in interpretation that needs to be conveyed to them. So if I'm in the audience and I, I elbow the guy next to me and I go, that's a great conductor, why am I? Why am I saying that's a great? What am I looking for? Out well, there? you're actually trying to. You're hearing. I. Th I think it's something that you know. When you hear something visceral and you hear something that really connects with you, and you hear the musicians 
connecting with you. I mean, really, that's the most important thing is that the musicians themselves are connecting with the audience. I mean, you see my back. So, right. you know, my, my job is not the audience. My job is the musicians. My job is trying to get them to play as best as they can so that they connect with you. So in the same way that a, a certain director might be known for action pictures, another for dramas, and another for comedy, <laughs> right. there are conductors that, I mean, all you got to kind of do is make a little movement and the whole thing jumps, or they're very demonstrative. It's, it's basically similar to that? It's very similar. I mean, there are conductors, uh, you know, Leonard Bernstein, for example, was known as a very demonstrative conductor. I mean, jumped around and everything. But one of his teachers, one of the teachers that he used to have was Fritz Reiner, who was the famous conductor of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra for many years. And Fritz Reiner was known to have the smallest gesture possible. I mean, yeah. really just tiny, tiny, tiny. And Bernstein would talk about this, that it was incredible that he could have the smallest gesture. And then the moment he raised his hand, the sound that poured out of the orchestra, because it's all relative, of course. Um, yet Bernstein was the complete opposite. Bernstein couldn't help but be so evocative and so emotional, you know, emotive with his gestures. And so, you know, yeah, I think everyone finds their own way. And the audience sits back and they, they sense that. They of can course, feel that. Absolutely. Now, can a great conductor lead an average orchestra? And can an average kind of pedestrian conductor lead a great orchestra? You know what I'm trying to say here? I mean, it's, yes. can, that, can that dynamic happen? Because I would think one would pull up the other. Well, that, it's true. And I think um, you'll, you'll, the, the, the learning curve of an orchestra um, you know, if we take your, your example of a great conductor leading a not so great orchestra, then most likely the learning curve of that orchestra is going to be huge because they will find, because a, a, an experienced conductor will know how to get the best out of them. Uh, that's really the, the mark of a great conductor, somebody who can really get the best out of whoever they have in front of them. And a mediocre conductor might not do that with a great orchestra, but you might not know the difference because a great orchestra can play themselves too yeah, sometimes. Yeah. And that's the thing, you know, sometimes you go to a great uh, orchestra concert and it'll sound very good, but the impact that the person at front is making may not be that big. That's when the guy next to you elbows you and says, <laughs> you know, they could be a lot better than if they had a better conductor. <laughs> that's true. Right. Hey, uh, what got you, into music? Obviously, you started very young. Was there a moment when you were a kid, uh, like an, uh, an aha moment that propelled you and you realized, this is what I'm going to do with my life? I think that I had many of them, actually. I, you know, I was very lucky um, living in New York, in New York City. Um, and I didn't realize this until, of course, I left, but I was afforded so many wonderful opportunities. Um, I was going to the Fame High School, though. The, if you've seen the movie Fame, that's yes. the high school I went to, Performing Arts High School, which is now in Lincoln Center. I was going to Juilliard on Saturdays, so, uh, LaGuardia High School on, uh, during the week. I was playing at the New York Youth Symphony on Sundays, and everything took place basically on the campus of, of Lincoln Center. And so I was spending all my week, even though I lived in Queens, I would commute every day, and I was spending all my time in Lincoln Center among the New York Philharmonic, among the Met Metropolitan Opera, going to Carnegie Hall, yeah. student tickets, you know. And so my life was music. And so I had certainly had little milestones throughout that time, um, but I couldn't have imagined anything else. Yeah. So it's, it's almost like a kid who gets into sports. They play the sport so much and they wind up being good at the sport because they're there they're, they're all the they're time. Because they're there all the time. But you have to have a talent for it. And were there people telling you, you know, you can go places? Um, I think I had a good mix of, of different different things. I mean, I, I, I was a violinist at first and I knew I was going to go as far as a certain point on the violin. I mean, I played professionally. Um, but And then conducting, of course, usually happens later. Yes. That's usually something, like any leader, you know, usually the ha leadership roles happen in, later in life. Um, but, you know, I, I, I had really good opportunities and I had a passion for it early on and I started to find opportunities for myself to do it. Um, and it was, but it wasn't until I, I went to the Aspen Music Festival. The Aspen Music Festival in Aspen, Colorado is actually a very well-known classical music festival with a very prestigious conducting program. And I happened to get accept, accepted into it at an early age for, for a conductor, I was 20. Um, um, but that was sort of a, a, a little bit of a rite of passage to a career in conducting because everybody who goes there has some experience, has yeah. some, some career. And I didn't at, the, at that point. I was just a kid undergrad. I didn't know anything. And so that was intimidating, but at the same time gave me confidence by the end of the summer that maybe this was something I could do. Yeah, that's when yeah. you know that the stars were starting to align a little bit <laughs> right. there. Hey, before we go, uh, usually when we have classical folks in here, I always ask, is, is there a piece of, let's say someone's listening right now, they go, I just don't get classical. I'm trying. I just don't get it. Is there a piece piece of music that you think people should listen to as a good entree into classical well, music? That's a good question. That's a good question. I love Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. For me, I think that every time I hear a great performance of that, I can't imagine anybody not be 
gripped and because it has everything. It has drama, it has uh, the, the, the soft side of classical music, the second movement, which is such a beautiful melody. It has everything. And for me, that's always the first. It's such a cliche thing because it's the fam famous four notes that yeah, everybody yeah. knows. Sure. Um, but I think, you know, if you really hear a great performance live, it's something that can, can grip you, I think so. And very quickly, last question. Your favorite uh, piece of music to conduct? <laughs> um, whatever it is that week. So come in here, Carmina Burana, which is what I'm going to be conducting that <laughs> All week. All right. Well, you're doing a great job already Thank promoting. You. It's great to meet you. Good to have you. I here. appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Guitar virtuoso Nils Lofgren is in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, inducted as a member of Bruce Springsteen's E Street Band. But Lofgren also has a long and storied career as a solo artist. Now, a conversation with Nils Lofgren. What a pleasure to have you here. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, DC kid, E Street Band, what, and yet an Arizona resident. How'd you wind up here? Well, I started in Chicago on the south side near Midway, and my dad moved us to Maryland outside of DC when I was eight. And that was really where I cut my teeth. And, um, you know, I was on the road at 17, 1968, I hit the road. This, this month's 46 years on the road for me. But we traveled everywhere, and I was in uh, the Stone Pony, famous nightclub in New sure. Jersey. And at the end of the night, I met this beautiful young girl on the bus that was with a friend of hers, and one of the roadies had him on the bus. And Amy Aiello talked her into hanging out with me, and I, I had to leave at 6 a.m. for Boston. And I was begging her to come to Boston to, so we could get to know each other. But she had, you know, she said her mom would kill her and her boss, she had a job. Of course, I said I'd square it and call everyone, but she didn't think that would work. So I was in Jersey every three months and I thought I'd see her again, but 15 years went by. Mm. And then 18 years ago at the Rockin' Horse, a great rock club we you had bet. here in town. You bet. I was passing through, she walked up and said, hi, remember me. We were both at the end of divorces, and a very long, beautiful story short, we've uh, been together ever since. And you're here ever since. Yeah, 18 years here in the Valley. My, my mom and brothers are still in D.C. We go visit and yeah. talk them into coming out here. But, you know, I love it here, and this is my home. The, does where you live impact your music? C c w would you be the same Nils Lofgren if you were born and raised in Arizona? Well, I think so, basically, because if you're a musician, in my case in particular, I fell in love with uh, performing. It's a gift I have. Uh, so you travel and you spend probably as much time away from home as home. Uh, I, I wouldn't, I'm sure if you studied it, you know, psychiatrists studied it, your geography has something to do with it. But there's been times when uh, I've been in one of the most beautiful settings in the world and I've had the blues and just haven't felt like writing a song. I've been in a terrible dingy bar and gotten an insp inspired idea and put it on a little boom box, you know? Yeah. So I'd like to think it's a little bit more uh, some God-given talent I had and a love of music that leads to the cre creative stuff. When did you know you had that God-given talent? Because you were very successful very young. You know, I started at five years old on the accordion of all things, south side of Chicago. Everyone played accordion. I asked for lessons. My folks paid for 10 years of accordion lessons. And after the waltzes and polkas, you move into classical, which I did. I entered contests, I won contests. So I knew I had a gift for music, but of course it was just fun and therapeutic. Uh, and at 15, I picked up the guitar as a hobby. 
in the mid 60s you know we worshiped Jimi hendrix and the beatles and the stones but you didn't do that for a living you know as a teenager and one night i saw the who in 1967, and then I went over across town in Washington, D.C. and saw the late show of Jimi Hendrix Experience. Mm. And that night I was possessed with the notion of being a rock musician. Hit the road when I was 17, a lot of ups and downs, but obviously 46 years later, I, it worked out. It did work out for you. Looking back, hitting the road that young, being, I mean, playing on million selling albums as a teenager, playing piano, which apparently you played the accordion, so I guess you knew how to play the piano, although you didn't know how to play all that well, did you? Well, it was a strange thing. Um, Thanks to meeting Neil Young when I was 17 at a nightclub, I used to sneak back and ask advice from my heroes because I knew nothing about music business. And he befriended me. We stayed in touch. Uh, my band Grin, three weeks later, was in L.A. anyway. And he turned us on to his producer, David Briggs. And we moved in with David, and he produced Grin. But as we were going through our ups and downs, I saw Neil a lot. So a year later, at 18 years of age, he asked me to do the After the Gold Rush album. Yes. And him and David said, you're going to play guitar, sing, and a little piano. And I'm like, well, I'm not a professional piano player. And those two were the ones who had more confidence in me than I did. And they said, look, you, you played classical accordion for 10 years. They knew my history. You've won contests. We saw the trophy. I said, so what? And they said, well, we just need a few simple parts, and we believe you'll find them. And I was like, really? So uh, that's the beautiful thing about from the classical thing where everything is written, very serious studies, Flight of the Bumblebee, all these masterpieces I had to learn. Then all of a sudden you're playing blues guitar, and you can make mistakes, you can be funky, you can be out of tune. And if, if you're feeling something special and deliver it, it works. So yes. it's kind of a magical kingdom from the classical world on accordion. But it served me well playing the piano on After the Gold Rush album. And, and, and again, working with and meeting these heroes of yours, because you are a rock fan. You've mentioned that numerous times. In terms of songwriting, now, you had your band Grin, which is just a phenomenal band. I remember it from, D it's, as a DC kid, I mean, you're just, you know. Uh, anyway, you got Grin, you got the solo career, which people don't even, some people don't even, they think of you as the E Street guitarist. You had quite the career before E Street. Yeah, well, you know, it's okay. I, people will come to my show and say, hey, we took a chance. We, because you were Bruce Springsteen's guitar player, we had no idea you wrote songs or sang. And that's this, a common story if you don't have big hit records. And I don't mind if someone comes and finds out I sing and write, and maybe at the merch table at the end of every show, you know, I'm, I had a nice 26 month break from that playing with the E Street Band, and now I'm getting back to my own shows. Of course, big show coming up October 3rd here at the Talking Stick. Okay. But, um, you know, I, I love people coming to check me out for any reason, and then the goal is to do something special with my own songs and voice and guitar, of course that'll make him want to come back again. Why didn't Grin make it big? Why didn't the solo career get bigger than it was? Oh, it's, it's you know, uh, unless you have like, yeah, unless you're Bruce Springsteen or Sting, it's like 98% of people that make records or more have the same story. You work your heart out, you make your best records, the company gets excited, they put it out, they promote it a bit. It never translates into heavy rotation. You know, that beautiful thing where they play the song so much that the world claims to be sick of it. Mm -hmm. And that's every musician's dream, you know. And it just didn't happen. I, I, I prefer, as opposed to pointing fingers at the record company, which of course there's some of that, uh, I prefer just to focus on myself and like, okay, let's get a little better. And for 20 years now, I haven't had a company. Thanks to the internet, I have nilslofman.com. I make music I'm proud of and sell it there. I go sing and play a lot post all the dates there, and I'm still working on a record, and uh, I've got, I'm gonna work on another record coming up, but of course I put a 45 year retrospective out last month called Face the Music. Yeah, this is, this is, uh, it's gotta be fantastic. I mean, you got, you got stuff pre-green, you got when you were a teenager in here, correct? Yeah, you know, hats off to Fantasy Records, they went and got everything I wanted. We filled up 10 discs, there's nine CDs, two bonus discs, and a DVD of some obscure, beautiful footage. And I'm, you know, so grateful because a lot of my old music is out of print. Again, not a unique story for musicians mm -hmm. that didn't have big hit records, but to assemble it all, hand pick it, put, it, put the order back together, and there's a 136 page story that Dave Marsh, the rock writer, insisted I write and he edit with a beautiful forward. My wife Amy, you know, picked the artwork and worked with the art directors, our assistant Omar. We turned our home upside down for 18 months and we really were the brain trust of producing this. And uh, Amy's got great taste artistically. I, you know, I put on terrible outfits. I, the only thing I'm really, I think, pretty good at is playing music. In front of an audience, I'm pretty safe bet. Other than that, you know, it's, it's kind of iffy. So <laughs> hats off to Amy and Omar, our assistant, was incredibly helpful. And 
18 months of working with people all over the country to go through thousands of pictures, old ephemera, you know, posters, this and that, 45s, and put a great story together. When you listened, especially when you listened to some of the early music, what do you think? You know, I'm surprised uh, at, at kind of the sincerity and honesty and intent, and it, it, I, I notice it instantly. And again, I was blessed in a way, in the 60s, first of all, there was an explosion of beautiful music from British Invasion, Stax Volt, Motown, the old blues guys. I go to the same club I met Neil Young, you know, Muddy Waters let me hang out in the dressing room and watch him play cards, and then he did two shows that night for me. So I got to see a lot of powerful performances, but there was no video, there was no internet. So the only game in town, you had to learn how to play in front of people. Mm -hmm. So that's all you did was play in front of an audience. And to this day, that serves me well. It's kind of a home for me. It's where I feel comfortable. Of course, you're being judged, but it's just some place that feels like a second home for me. And I feel like I know what I'm doing. I like to take chances and improvise. And it just seems to always work out if I prepare properly. But when you listen to some of the older music, do you say, I wonder why I made that chord change or maybe that solo should have gone here? I mean, do you do that or you just go, what a kid that was. Yeah, that's all. You know, a lot of artists will re-record their music. Yes. And, you know, I will go, you know what? I'm singing better now 40 years later. Shocker, you should be singing better. But um, there's an there's a innocence, innocence and a charm yes. to really hard work on a team of people with a common goal. And under the you know, supervision, we got lucky, David Briggs, Neil Young's producer, produced all the Grin records. And there, there's an innocence and charm and power to that and emotion to that that I wouldn't want to redo. So now when I listen back to it, I'm so far away from it, yeah. I can enjoy it again because it's not something I normally do is listen to my own stuff. And of course, I had to do it, a lot of it to put this together. When you were doing uh, your own, writing your own, still writing your own songs, <clears throat> but, but especially when you were first starting, did you, did you read a book? Did you to ask your mentors? How do, do you know the one, four, five chords? I mean, how does that work for someone so young? Well, everyone is different. For me, I, I fell in love with rock and roll through the Beatles and the Stones, and that opened the floodgates to the British invasion. Stax, Volt, Motown, all of it. So I was always, you know, kind of uh, inspired by those types of songs. Just There's many of them, beautiful songs, lyrics, and I'd sit there with a piano or a guitar. I, my first songs I wrote were on the accordion oh. before I picked up, you know, <laughs> the guitar. But again, I just, thanks to my mom and dad and whatever higher power there is, I, I had a gift for melody and mixed with some rhythms and the inspiration of, of the acts at the time. And you learn from them. I mean, you study the Beatles songs and how they crafted it, the Motown songs. And it's like guitar playing. At first you play the Hendrix lick, then the Eric Clapton lick, then the B.B. King lick. But after two or three years, all of a sudden it started melting into my own thing, which is ideally what you hope for in songwriting. But I think any great songwriter, and I've done that, whether it's Bruce Springsteen or Neil Young, we'll all talk about, oh yeah, that song I got inspired by Buddy Holly, that song, right, 45 right. years ago. So it all, it, we all take the soup of the best of the best from the last hundred years, even classical, because I was mired in deep classical melodies for 10 years, and that served me well, too. You, and, and you mentioned, obviously, starting very young, playing with Neil Young, obviously the E Street Band now. Um, some guys, well, you, you had a career going there, yeah. and that, and, but you're a session guy, you're a band member. Um, how different is it from being the guy in the spotlight to the guy on the side with the guitar? Well, it's a little different, but if, you, if you're working with people you love and you're engaged by you know, the, the journey, then it's kind of similar. Um, and I will say when I was 18 and I did the After the Gold Rush record with Neil Young and Ralphie Molina, who I knew, I made the first Crazy Horse album with them. Uh, Greg Reeves was the bass player from Crosby, Stills and Nash. But I, I remember vi vividly going to work going, God, it's kind of nice not to be the boss today. Yeah. But I'm in Neil Young's band. Yeah. And I realize it's, it's cool. And, and honestly, it's refreshing for me. A lot of solo artists are uncomfortable if they're not the boss. Personally, I found it very um, inspiring and refreshing. Like for instance now, 26 months on the road with the E Street Band. Now I'm excited about my next record that I'll write, which I haven't even started yet because I'm getting ready to do shows. But I'm not musically rusty because I had this great adventure with the E Street Band. And for me personally, I love, it. One, one helps the other. Yeah. It's very inspiring to be in a great band. You know when you're the band leader, there's a lot of non-musical issues. I'm happy to do them, but they have nothing to do with music. You know, a couple of roadies, you know, you get 
have a fight, you wait in, some musician gets cranky, you have to be a psychiatrist. All that goes away when you're in somebody else's band. It does. And it's all about music. Plus, I get to sing harmony. I get to play rhythm guitar. I get to play pedal steel, dobro, lap steel, bottleneck, all these idiosyncratic sounds that I've learned that when you're the band leader, rightfully so, you should pretty much play all the solos and sing all the songs. So I love being in a band with different responsibilities than the standard, you know, well, leader. It, it's obvious you love music. You love what you do. I mean, the, the, the joy is there. You're, you're not some guy who's going through them. I mean, it, it's obvious. You're just speaking with you. Now, yeah. again, Talking Stick is when? October 3rd, first Friday of October, about 8 to 10, over at the showroom at the Talking Stick. My first, some of my first shows in... Uh, Three years. Okay. Very excited. I'm practicing now. Good. Me and my buddy Greg Varlotta, a great local player. But it's not just acoustic. There's electric, acoustic, there's tap dancing, there's trumpet, a lot of crazy wild stuff, and I really will dig in deep on the guitars, electric and acoustic. We're running out of time. Right. I, 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 the Grin 1 Plus 1 album, I still have it. I still love it. I was <clears> a kid when I got it. You were a kid when you made it. Um, there's a song called Hi, Hello, Home. We're running out of time. I thank you so much for joining us, and I thank you for stopping by with this, this box set, which looks fantastic. Yeah, you can get it at illsoffman.com. There's a lot of free music and info there, too. So cool. Thanks uh, for having thank me. Thank you so much. And can you play Hi, Hello, Home? I love that yeah, song. Yeah, let me fire that up for you okay. here. Hi, hello, home. It's good to be alone. Hope it ain't been hurting you this missing me. Been away so long, I thought you felt wrong. Play with me tonight, sing some harmony. Friends I tried to feel, they taught me how to steal. Locking me in rooms dark with misery Missed you till I cried But now I'm back inside I just wanna hide with you in harmony Hi, hello, home Hi Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.